we are going to commence the second chapter of the isotopes, isotopes 12, to address the theme, nuclear power generation and possible contributions from chemical and process engineering. And now to begin the today's session, it's my pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker today for Isotalk 12, engineer Udita Vijayaratna. He graduated from the Department of Chemical and Process Engineering, University of Moratua, with the honor of a first class. As an undergraduate, he took the initiative to, to form the Process Engineering Consultancy Services and completed several experimental and pilot scale projects successfully. Uh, upon graduation, he joined the Department of Chemical and Process Engineering, University of Moratua, as a lecturer. In 2015, he continued to study for the MSc in Nuclear Engineering at Ontario Tech University in Canada. Since 2019, he is serving as a nuclear operator attached to the Ontario Power Generation Hickory Nuclear Generating Station. So, this is our guest speaker for the 12th session in Isotopes. And without any further ado, let's warmly welcome our speaker, Engineer Udita Vijayaratna. Sir, the stage is yours. Thank you, Sasinia, and uh, uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all, uh, the future engineers and um, especially the chemical and process engineers. So uh, today we will uh, keep our discussion uh, very open. So I don't really, I have some slides, but I don't really need to stick into the slides. So uh, it's basically um, uh, talk about uh, how the nuclear reactors work and uh, uh, specific things about the CANDU reactors that we use in Canada and what's the day-to-day -day life as a nuclear operator. And um, very importantly, I want to talk to you all about uh, the future opportunities after graduation um, to move into higher studies and uh, any other aspects that you all are interested about. So <clears throat> I would appreciate any uh, feedback or any um, like two-way communication, not just me talking. So it's, um, it's the opportunity for you to raise all the questions and uh, um, I will try my best to answer for anything. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I have some slides uh, put up together. Uh, we'll start with that, but don't hesitate, don't hesitate to stop me at any time. Right. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see my screen. So uh, this is a Pickering um, power station in Ontario. It has six running units, even though it's designed with eight units, two units are decommissioned in 2000. Um, so basically let's move on to, so if we talk about nuclear power, uh, we have two basic options, nuclear fission and uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, fusion is uh, still uh, in the experimental stage uh, which they're trying uh, to bring it up hopefully in uh, 20 to 30 years as a commercial operation. But as of now, we have all the reactors in the nuclear fission, which uh, is uh, simply uh, splitting atoms into two or more smaller products, nuclear products. And um, basic fuel we used here in Canada is the uranium. Special is the natural uranium. Uh, the reason is uh, natural uranium is uh, quite cheap, especially in Saskatchewan. There's a lot of mining facilities uh, to produce natural uranium, and uh, the technology used in the candle reactors uh, with the heavy water, which is G2O instead of H2O. Um, you can simply use natural uranium uh, without any enriching, uh, saves a lot of money. 
So this will be the simple uh, chain reaction. Even though it looks simple, the fission products are really hard to predict. It's not like a chemical product A plus B going to C and D. Uh, these fission products could be anything depending on the uh, condition of the reaction um, uh, reactor and uh, any impurities involved with the fuel, uh, number of neutron percent, and a lot of uh, lot of factors affecting. So it's more of like an uh, empirical approach uh, nuclear physicists use to predict the fission products, and at the same time to uh, get the neutron number of neutrons in the preceding generation. This n dash or the number of neutrons in the second generation compared to n, which is the number of neutrons involved in the fission or reaction in the first generation, uh, is quite important because uh, if n and n dash are the same, uh, that means the reactor a reaction is critical, uh, meaning the chain reaction uh, sustained in the same level, which is not going to increase or decrease the um, reactor power. If um, N is greater than N dash, that means reactor is in a subcritical, <laughs> subcritical condition, meaning the reactor power is going down, or the number of neutrons produced in the second generation is quite lower than the first generation. In the other hand, if N is less than N dash, that means a, a supercritical reaction, uh, which is which is really um, unsafe because it's pretty hard to control uh, once the reaction passed a certain uh, level of reactivity. Um, so it's very controlled. The super supercritical reactivity is um, quite controlled during a uh, reactor runoff. Uh, so if we talk about the energy production here. Uh, famous Einstein's equation is used because the left-hand side of the reactants mass is not the quite same as the product side. Uh, if you add everything in the left side, it's normally less than what you have in the right side. Uh, the difference is the difference in the mass is converted into the energy of that uh, specific fission reaction. That's how the um, energy is generated in, in basic. Um, so talk about fusion is in the opposite of the fission, basically. It's combined two or more atoms to produce a new particle. <laughs> in the same time, uh, uh, it can harvest some amount of energy. So fusion is important because it's considered as a future solution for the nuclear fission waste. That's reverting back what we did as the fission reaction uh, because nuclear waste is considered as a significant factor when implementing any nuclear reactors or any country. What to do with this waste? That's a challenging question, which we still don't have a solid solution. Uh, other than uh, storage facilities, which going to be hundred and thousand of years because of decay time of the fission products, um, sometimes like million years. Moving further, so these are the basic uh, reactor designs. I would say the um, popular reactor designs over the world. Different countries has developed their own technologies over different times. <clears throat> However, widely used in North America are the pressurized uh, water reactors and boiling water reactors. Um, in the US, uh, especially all, almost all the reactors are boiling water reactors, which usually use uh, enriched uranium. Um, pressurized water reactors, um, Depending on the reactor uh, design, you can use enriched or natural uranium. So CANDO belongs to the pressurized heavy water reactors. It is uh, basically a derivative from the pressurized water reactors, but it uses heavy water 
instead of regular uh, regular water for the cooling purpose. Um, and the gas cool reactors, light water graphite, and fast neutron reactors. Some of them are in uh, experimental stage and then ended up not going into commercial stage. And the latest addition to the list is the small modular reactors. I'll talk about it uh, later in the presentation. Um, so that's the new trend um, all over the world to build up uh, small modular reactors compared to uh, multi-unit uh, generating stations. Mm. All right, if we <clears throat> look into the difference between pressurized water reactors and the boiling water reactors, Main difference is, as you can see, uh, oh, sorry. As you can see in the pressurized water reactor. So the reactor is um, contained in a containment structure, which has very restricted access. Steam generators, or simply the boilers, are used to extract heat from the reactor. This is this is called the primary loop of the pressurized water reactor. It could be light water, it could be heavy water, depending on the design. If it is heavy water, that's where I ended up with pressurized heavy water reactors. If it is just light water, like H2O, it's just a primary loop. And the secondary loop is obviously light water flowing from the boilers to the turbine, condenser and back the boilers. Um, third loop is used to cool the condenser or condense the remaining uh, steam from the turbine. Um, it could be the a huge body of water like a lake or a river or any cooling towers like in this picture. It all depends on the uh, site selection and the technology uh, and the cost, uh, everything uh, to play a role to select this cooling, uh, cooling medium. Uh, and the other thing is, if anything leaked from the reactor, that's to the primary loop, uh, most likely it's going to contain within the loop. So this primary water is highly radioactive and will not be released to the environment during normal operation. Uh, given that the secondary loop is completely physically separate and uh, it is uh, possible to release this steam during a uh, unit transient um, without any uh, risk to the public. If anything is leaking between primary and secondary loop, there are so many things uh, to detect that leak and uh, safely, safely shut down the unit and fix the issue. Um, but if you look into the boiling water reactor, there's no steam generator in the boiling water reactor. So basically the reactor is acting as the boiler. So again, in the pressurized water reactor, there's no any boiling going on in the reactor. Uh, this loop is at a higher pressure. And uh, so as per the steam tables, if you look into the tables, if the pressure goes up, the saturation temperature also going up in the same time. So this primary loop brings um, high temperature liquid water into the steam generator, usually the tube side, primary side. And the secondary side of the shell side contains light water at a lower pressure. So for the CANDU reactors, this loop is at about 10 megapascals and secondary loop is about four megapascals. So it gives a significant difference in uh, pressures and temperatures. So it, it, it boils water in the secondary loop, not in the primary loop. Uh, that's how the steam is produced in the boilers. But in the boiling water reactors, uh, heat is released directly to the only single loop, uh, light water, and that produced steam is directly going to the turbine and then pass with the condenser and then back into the reactor. So um, the significant negative re, uh, feedback, um, negative uh, uh, issue of this uh, type of reactors is if anything to repair with the turbine. And if the turbine is open up, 
um, it's going to be a nightmare because all the radioactivity is going to emit to the workers working in the secondary side of the, or people working outside of the containment as well. Um, and if anything happened, they can release this steam to the environment at any point because the steam is highly radioactive in the boiling water reactors. Uh, so in either case, turbine drives the generator and then it produces electricity, send it to the grid, uh, powering up uh, the cities. So after that, uh, you look into the demand in Ontario. This is just the province of Ontario. I didn't even uh, add the numbers uh, for the whole country. So average is about 17 gigawatts. Um, same as any other country, we have a peak. Peak demand around late evenings or late afternoons. <laughs> Design capacity about 60% nuclear power. Given that it's in the peak time. So now it's about seven in the morning, which has very low demand at the Saturday morning. Probably it's running around 60% right now with a couple of reactors uh, out of service even. So OPG, or Ontario Power Generation, uh, responsible for 6.6 .6 gigawatts. And Bruce Power is about 6.2 gigawatts. That's total up to 60% of the provincial demand. So this is quite a interesting. Um, Website that will try to I'll try to load that. Um, okay, so this is. <laughs> Fairly latest um, data. Uh, can you see the uh, website right now? It's the grid watch. I'm not sure if I'm sharing the screen. Okay. So anyway, um, this is the data for like last last hour between five to six in the morning. So the total demand is about 13 gigawatts in Ontario. 57.9% uh, 57 is from nuclear. So this is the breakdown of all the reactors in Ontario. Bruce has eight reactors. Three shut down for their major component replacement, meaning it's like after, after 30 to 40 years of operation, those reactors need to retool and uh, do major component replacements um, for the license purpose. And then uh, uh, can continue operation for like 30 to 40 more years. And uh, Darlington is also undergoing the same scenario, Darlington need one, three. Uh, they're doing their refurbishment. And uh, Pickering Unit A4 or Pickering Unit 4 is on uh, plan outage as well. So as of now, we have uh, only, um, we have five, six reactors shut down, but eventually still provided 60%, almost 60% uh, at this demand. Um... It's not loading up for some reason. Oh, yeah. yeah. So 
if you look at the trend, so this is CO2 emission basically as a result of the gas power turbine used uh, throughout the night, throughout the early morning. Uh, the reason is nuclear is usually provide the base load at any given time. Um, we never run nuclear reactors at any other power than 100% full power. There are many reasons for that. Uh, fluctuation of power is not safe for nuclear reactors, so that's why it's provide basic load. And the cushion space mainly provided by hydro, which is the light blue. <clears throat> Once we run up, uh, hydro, hydro power or the water, uh, uh, hydrostatic, hydroelectric power. Uh, then the third choice is to power up the gas turbines. So gas turbines are always ready to go, but this just waiting uh, to, to get coal to power up because it's pretty easy to uh, start up shutdown and uh, change power levels or the generating levels of the gas turbines compared to hydro and uh, nuclear. And the green ones, I believe, those are the um, wind turbines. So wind, um, solar is not up yet, but solar will eventually pick up during the daytime. Um, they all depends on the weather conditions, wind and solar, but basically it provides by nuclear, and hydro and um, gas power. Back to the slide. So I have some uh, sort of a uh, screen here. We're going to the Lake Huron, it has the uh, In Cardian is where the Bruce Power is. Uh, so it's right here. So all the nuclear stations uh, in Ontario are basically cooled by the uh, lakes. So then they don't really have any cooling towers or anything. Instead, um, this is the intake channel for Pickering. This is uh, Pickering unit one, two, three, four. This side is five, six, seven, eight. Currently, you need. Two and uh, three are out of service. They are decommissioned in year 2000 uh, because they predicted uh, the demand will go down at that time, but eventually it flipped after a couple of years and um, province had to face significant um, shortage of electricity right after they decommissioned these two units. Uh, so, Anyhow, this is the this is what you call the screen house. <coughs> the role of this building or the operators in this building is to ensure all the big debris coming up with this water from the lake to remove the debris and uh, filter out the significant quite um, clean water for the cooling purpose of these four reactors. Um, of the you know, Pickering, uh, Pickering B, unit five, six, seven, and eight. Um, there are so many things coming up with the water, like fish, algae, even the golf balls in the summertime, because a lot of recreational activities going across the lake, um, going on the lake shore. Um, so these are the reactor containment buildings. <laughs> Uh, designed to be leak proof and uh, internal pressure is maintained roughly slightly below atmospheric I would say it's not it's not a huge vacuum but it's slightly below atmospheric pressure the whole idea is if anything leaks out uh, to the containment from the reactor components to to maintain everything uh, in the system rather than release it to the environment there's always a airflow into the containment, not from the containment to the outside. Uh, this is the turbine hall. We will see the inside of the building uh, shortly, but for now, um, this building is the B-side uh, turbine hall has four different turbines, one turbine for each unit. 
and a single turbine consists of one high pressure and three low pressure turbines in series and a generator for each turbine. So it's a huge, a huge uh, flow with uh, significant space footprint. These tanks are the DME tanks, one tank per each unit, can provide uh, DME water for the secondary loop of the reactor. If you can remember from the previous picture, uh, boiling, sorry, pressurized water reactor is the secondary loop, which is the light water. So these DME water tanks supply any um, water to the secondary loop given that the water is losing to the environment as a steam leaks or if unit is undergoing any transient. So if we had to reduce the power of the reactor, so the first step is to relieve some amount of heat. Uh, the production or the reactor power is set back to whatever the required power, say is going from 100% to 80% full power. Uh, so when the reactor power is going down, in the same time we have to release some energy to the environment. It's going to be through these uh, steam reject valves. Uh, we have 10 valves per unit. It's going to blast through the secondary loop, light water steam to the environment. And to compensate for that losing uh, inventory, these steam in water tanks had to provide water into the system. That's the whole idea of having these tanks. Um, what else? So this is the switch yard. After producing the heat, uh, electricity from the generators, they're coming to the main output transformer right here. Then the main output transformer connects into the switch yard. So switch yard is basically under the control of Hydro One, which is the distributor. So the uh, OPG line of operation going to end in this um, border. So it yeah, belongs to the hydro one. They do, uh, they're doing the maintenance and operations in this side. And we have a station service transformer here. The whole idea of having that transformer is to provide backup power to the unit. Uh, because nuclear reactors are quite different than the uh, other sort of power generation, you can't just turn off or shut down the reactor and walk away because shutting down the reactor will reduce power from 100% to say 0%, but still um, we don't have any fission, fission chain reactions going on, but still we have the decay reactions going on. Decay reactions are the critical thing that we had to provide after shutdown cooling. Yeah. But to remove the decay heat, that's where all the nuclear accidents has happened, like Fukushima Daiichi uh, in 2011. Uh, if you look into that documentary, if you read about it, it's like all the safety systems works fine until up to the point the reactor shut down by itself and then it went to the cooling stage to remove the decay heat. And um, primary supply for the decay heat removal is from the grid. Same here, SSD or the system service transformer. Uh, drain energy from the grid to the transformer and then give it back to the unit to provide uh, critical cooling um, for the decay heat removal. Uh, but in Fukushima, what happened was the grid failed and then the secondary or the backup power started up. That is the standby generators. Uh, we also have the same thing here, standby generators, if the grid fail. Um, the other option for the multi-unit unit, uh, stations, if, if one unit shut down, it can provide power from the adjacent or the sister unit. But there are some situations, like in Fukushima, we had to shut down all the units at the same time. So there's no backup from any other unit. The only alternative is from the grid. And uh, with with some situations, the grid can fail and the system service transformer can uh, drain any power from the grid. So that's where the standby generators kicks in and then provide power to the critical cooling loads. Uh, that's all we had up to like 2003, where we had a significant event in Pickering. 
Um, so the grid failed because this grid is connected to the New York in the US. Uh, some event happened in New York in 2003, started to cascade down the grid from US side all the way to all the way to Pickering and uh, started to fail the bulk, bulk electrical system. So those low unit, uh, events called LOBS events, loss of bulk electrical uh, system. So no supply from, uh, I mean, there's no place to put out the electricity produced by the units. When the grid failed, so I had to shut down all the units at the same time. And the standby generators didn't work in this, this significant day. So we didn't have any other um, mode of power supply. Standby generators are the only backup uh, for the cooling. So at that time, so um, this design, uh, the reactor designs in a significant way that um, reactors are located below the steam generators. Uh, so the heated water in the reactor can go up to this because it's it's uh, when the temperature goes up, it reduces density, right? So uh, hot water goes up to the boilers and then release heat to the boiler and then get cooled down and uh, density goes up with the temperature drops, come back to the reactor. That's called uh, thermosiphoning. So thermosiphoning was the um, life savior in that event. So after that happened, uh, Pickering started to introduce um, emergency power generators, which are located uh, right here in this building. We have two EPGs, emergency power generator one and two, and back. Obviously, manually starting up is not automatic. And this is the emergency water supply. So these things added to the unit, I mean, to the design after year 2003. Uh, after Fukushima event in 2011, another backup added uh, from here, that is the auxiliary power supply. This is basically to monitoring and provide uh, shutdown cooling. Can't do much because these are pretty small uh, power supplies. Uh, and moreover, we have these ones, emergency mitigating equipment. Those are just diesel powered generators, portable ones that can produce uh, electricity plus uh, pumping capacity if everything failed. That's the last back as introduced after 2011. So nuclear industry is not an um, isolated one. It's like if something happened in a, in a different country, like in Japan, it affects the nuclear industry all over the world. So when I was starting in 2015, uh, most of the people were asking, why are you starting a nuclear power now, nuclear studies now? Because it's like all the reactors is going planning to shut down in within like next five to 10 years because of the Fukushima event. It's not even in Japan, it's like in Europe and um, everywhere. But uh, eventually, people uh, realize that can survive for the survive with the future electricity demand without nuclear uh, generation. That's what happened in North America. It has a freezing of new uh, reactor designs and implementation. Now, the Pickering is running since 1960s, 1970s. It's pretty much the time to do the refurbishment. And it's originally planned to shut down in 2018 after 2011 incident in Japan. So when it comes to 2018, after seven years from the Fukushima event, uh, province has to realize that they can't just shut it down in 2018. So they ask for a license renewal. And um, again, for these nuclear facilities, it's the same in all over the world. So can't just put up a reactor anywhere. You have to do significant uh, licensing process. You have to undergo a significant licensing process and get approval. In Canada, the governing body is Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. 
it's a federal entity uh, that can regulate uh, nuclear generation and other radioactivity uh, within whole whole country, including all the provinces. So um, Pickering has to request a site uh, license extension from CNSC in 2018, and they granted it for 10 years up to 2028. The original plan was to shut down and decommission in 2024, that means next year, and then uh, decommission up to 20, 2028 and then uh, get rid of Pickering uh, units, all, all eight units. But eventually last year, they had to announce the refurbishment of B-side, uh, meaning unit 5, 6, 7, 8 for 30 to 40 more years. Uh, because because of the freezing of building new reactors, if they shut down Pickering units, it's going to be a grid imbalance that uh, pretty hard to come up an alternative solution, um, economical alternative solution with the rising um, demand for the electricity. So anyhow, uh, that's the normal operation and these things are the safety features. This is a vacuum building. <clears throat> That's again unique for the Kendu design. This reactor designs. Uh, this huge duct going across the station from unit four, three, two, one, five, six, seven, eight. All eight units connected to this duct. Uh, it's a pretty big duct. It looks wider than a two-lane highway inside the duct. Uh, so each unit connected to this duct, and this duct is connected to this vacuum building. As the name implies, this vacuum building is maintained at 10 kilopascal absolute pressure. <laughs> it's quite significant vacuum. Uh, that maintains the vacuum all the time. Uh, so I'll try to show, this is the connection from reactor containment to the duct. Same as here, I have connection from the duct to the vacuum building. This is called the pressure relief duct. If anything happened inside the reactor containment, so for an example, say primary loop started to leak. So it's a 10 megapascal heavy water start to leak into these buildings, which are maintained slightly below atmospheric. So it starts to flash into steam with no time and brings the pressure up in this building. So these are external pressure vessels. These are not designed to withstand internal pressure. So this connection is going to open up. It's like a flap that uh, can open inwards to this duct uh, and then release that pressure to this duct and then eventually goes up here and then um, sucked by this vacuum building. So, so this, <clears throat> the design inside the vacuum building, so it's at 70 kp, uh, sorry, 10 kp absolute. When the pressure rising in the vacuum building, it has a system uh, or mechanism activates like a fire sprinkler system. It dose water into the steam and bring the steam uh, back into the liquid stage. That does two things. One is to condense steam. Uh, when the steam condenses, it reduces the pressure inside this building because we need to maintain uh, about 36 to 48 hours of hold time in this building. Uh, all the steam released to the building. Try the max to condense it to make it liquid phase and then um, contain the radioactivity inside this building. Uh, because um, most of the radioactive components like radioiodine um, going to decay after a few hours, but there's like noble gases uh, like xenon, which is not going to be a uh, decay uh, after 48 hours. Um, anyhow, we had to release this um, uh, radioactive uh, effluent to the environment via the filtered air discharge mm -hmm. system. There's a separate system uh, which is going to release through this duct here. So that's why the 48 hours is significant. 48 hours provides the decay time for noble gases, radioiodine, and other 
significant uh, is, uh, isotopes. Plus, it provides the province of Ontario enough time to evacuate people within the, um, within the affected area. So it, it all depends on the wind direction. <laughs> if you can see, this power plant is not isolated uh, anymore because there's like neighborhood over here, even here, and there's like an in, um, industrial uh, area right here, right across the road. Um, so province needs some time to evacuate people to a significant distance, depending on the accident scenario and uh, the prevailing weather conditions. That's why the 48 hours is pretty significant. So, um, and this one here is called the golf ball, or the technical name is, uh, term is uh, emergency um, water storage tank. The whole idea is to provide inventory lost during an accident scenario, like primary loop breaks and then flash into steam and then steam travel to the vacuum building. So now we need to provide some water to the reactor to maintain fuel cooling because now the inventory is leaking out from the reactor. And um, that's from the primary loop. So this water is injected into the primary loop to ensure the fuel is cooled throughout the time. Um, so this water goes into the uh, high pressure uh, pumps in this building. Those pumps going to inject water to whatever the affected unit. And then there's like a reset mode that you can use um, over the time to keep the water loop ensuring the fuel is in a cool stage. Uh, again, another fact in the nuclear reactors, there are three Cs. It's called the golden rule of um, reactors. Control, cool, and contain. So control the reactor power, cool the fuel all the time, and contain radioactivity. Um, so this provides cool, this provides contain. Control is by the reactor regulating system, uh, which is a computer control program. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show in this. We go into. Nice. So that's inside. That's uh, this is the inside uh, arrangement. We have a control room. <clears throat> I actually two control rooms: one for the units one to four, and another one for unit five to eight. Uh, license operators. <laughs> Again, authorized nuclear operators, they need to get their license after five years training program, uh, which is get the certification um, as a certified nuclear operator from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, they're getting paid well, like $250,000 plus per year uh, to maintain the license and to bear the responsibility of their actions. Um, so control room, and have fuel management. Uh, so basically these reactors are capable of fueling while the reactor is on power. You never shut down units to fueling. That's a um, quite important factor of the candle reactors. You don't have to shut down units. Sometimes we had units running for more than two years in a straight time without you know, shut down. So this is like two fueling machines. One is injecting new fuel from this side and the other one is uh, getting the uh, used fuel on the other side. Uh, that's uh, basically the online fueling. So the reactor is located uh, at 274 elevation. So the elevation is given from compared to the lake level. Uh, starts with the 254 is the ground level. 225 is the basement, it's, uh, underground level. 
274 is the reactor um, starting at 274. Starts at 274. And the boilers or the steam generators are located at 317. So when I was talking about the thermosiphoning earlier, so 274 has the reactors with high temperature water, which has low density, can easily flow to the higher level, 317, and then release that heat through the secondary side of the boilers, and then temperature drops, density goes up, so the water comes back to the reactor. Uh, that's the last line of defense in terms of cooling. And uh, they haven't never tested that one before, uh, up to 2003, where they had to really um, put it that into practice. And then the steam is produced, the steam goes to the turbine, condense, and then back to the boilers. This is the reactor. <clears throat> Obviously, it's during the construction. Uh, this, the real size of the reactor compared to the size of a pe uh, person. So the reactor phase covered with a shell called calandria. So these fuel bundles has uh, uranium pellets in these pencils. So these single rods called the pencil. These pencils have fuel pellets inside the pencil. And these pencils bound together to bring up to a fuel bundle. These fuel bundles are loaded into these pressure tubes. And there are like 370 pressure tubes per reactor. Two so fuel bundles in a single pressure tube. It's a huge amount of fuel going into the reactor because these are not enriched. It's a natural uranium. So nuclear physics design which channel needs to get fueled every single day. Um, so they inject fuel, fresh fuel from one side and withdraw the used fuel from the other side. Um, so this design use heavy water for the moderation purpose, uh, meaning um, in the fission reaction, it produces neutrons. Those neutrons are very high um, energetic neutrons. We need to slow down those neutrons to maintain the chain reaction. Because if it's too too energetic, there's a high chance of getting the neutron escape the reactor itself and then will not cause any um, preceding um, fission chain reactions. To slow down, uh, use the moderator, uh, which is filled with heavy water. So this whole, whole shell here is filled with heavy water. It's called the moderator. This... It can't really separate the reactor from the moderator. Moderator is a component of the reactor itself. Uh, <clears throat> so natural uranium has uranium-238, about 99.3, and 235, about 0.7. Uh, we can enrich it. If it's a light water reactor, we can enrich it up to about 13% uranium-235. Uh, yeah, I talked about on power fueling, which is significant uh, in candle reactors. So, pickering units are designed to be 1744 megawatts thermal. So, the unit can produce up to 17,000, sorry, 1700 megawatts of thermal power when they're running at full power, but they can only produce 500 and 15, 520 megawatt of electricity. Um, the reason is the efficiency of the steam cycle. Uh, converting thermal to the electricals through the traditional steam cycle. They don't really worry about adding um, other things like we used to do in the coal power plants to increase that efficiency uh, because the fuel is quite cheap. Sometimes adding extra systems and putting up the maintenance uh, plus troubleshooting and all those investments to boost up this efficiency is not quite economical. And the other thing is in the nuclear stations, we can't just replace components if something failed. It's a pretty significant process to uh, replace even a small component. Uh, if, if the builder or the supplier is not providing the same thing, same device, 
over the time if they discontinue the product, you can't just go for a replacement. Have to get engineering approval, CNSA approval. It's a quite expensive process and it takes so long uh, to make sure that replacement component matches up to the original component uh, without putting uh, people's safety uh, or without compromising people's and unit safety. So this unit has 12 boilers per unit and 12 fuel barrels per channel and 390 channels uh, per reactor. So 21 adjuster rods. Uh, that's basically the controlling uh, mechanisms. And we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, so this is a video clip from Darlington uh, Station. It gives you um, introduction like this is again open source, so I can uh, refer to YouTube. Um, it gives uh, basically introduction to the station. It's pretty similar to the uh, Pickering, but the Darlington is um, pretty new. Um, instead of 515 megawatt uh, electrical, these units can produce about 780 megawatts. This is Darlington, on the shores of Lake Ontario, about 70 kilometers east of Toronto. It's one of Ontario Power Generation's two nuclear generating stations. And it's basically a factory for making lots of electricity, enough to power a city of around 2 million people. That's about 20% of Ontario's electricity needs. The building is divided into two main areas along its length. The nuclear side with the reactors and the conventional side with the turbine generators that make the electricity. There are four generating units at Darlington, units one to four, each with a reactor and a turbine generator. Each unit can generate 935 megawatts of electricity. Darlington produces electricity using the heat that comes from splitting uranium atoms in a process called nuclear fission. The fuel is naturally occurring uranium that's processed into small pellets. The pellets are sealed into metal tubes, which are welded together to form a fuel bundle. The fuel bundles are then inserted into a large tank called a calandria, which is the heart of the nuclear reactor. In can-do reactors, a special kind of water called heavy water flows around the fuel bundles. Heavy water is found in all water, rivers, lakes, and oceans. On average, one out of every 7,000 drops of water is heavy water. It's 10% heavier than ordinary water because it incorporates a heavy form of hydrogen called deuterium. The heavy water slows down tiny particles called neutrons, so they are more likely to hit and split the uranium atoms. A chain reaction of splitting atoms releases tremendous heat into the heavy water. The heated heavy water flows through a closed loop system that's pumped through the reactor to a set of steam generators where it transfers the heat to ordinary water. When that water boils, it turns into steam. The steam is transported at high pressure through pipes to a large turbine where it pushes the blades and turns a shaft connected to a rotor in the generator, causing the rotor to spin. The spinning rotor is a large electromagnet that produces rotating magnetic fields. These fields move across coils of copper wire in the generator, producing electricity. The electricity is fed into transmission lines that carry the power from Darlington to people's homes and businesses. All used fuel is carefully stored in safe and secure areas that are constantly monitored by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and the International Atomic Energy Agency.
So let's take a tour of Darlington. Before going into the station, everyone has to pass through a security building that operates a lot like an airport security system. There are machines to check for explosive chemicals, x-ray machines, and metal detectors. Then everyone has to pass through a turnstile where their security card and their individual hand bone structure must match. At all times, highly trained security staff inspect every person and everything entering and leaving the station. Then, all personnel pick up devices that are issued to them to constantly monitor for radiation while inside the station. Safety is the number one priority at all Ontario power generation facilities. So everyone working in the station must have the proper protective equipment safety glasses, hard hats, safety boots, gloves, and hearing protection. Visitors must also wear safety equipment. The main entry for the station is through an area known as Unit Zero. This is where the common systems for the entire station are located. Heating, lighting, ventilation, and the operations control room. Also located in Unit Zero are the mechanical maintenance shop, where experts in welding, machining, and pipe fitting work on equipment. The control maintenance shop for the experts in electrical, instrumentation, and electronic systems. And stores, where people pick up the tools and parts they need to do their job. The station is divided into zones according to the location of systems and equipment to prevent the transfer of radioactive materials. Whenever people or equipment move from zone to zone, they monitor to ensure no transfer of radioactivity. Let's start at the beginning of the fission process where heat is released from the fuel. Each of the four reactor buildings is made of heavily reinforced concrete with external walls two meters thick. When a reactor is operating, no one can enter the reactor vault, but when it's shut down for maintenance, radiation fields decrease and trained staff can safely work here. Technicians put on protective equipment, log in with their tools, and then access the reactor through the airlock system. The reactor consists of a large, heavily shielded vessel, or calandria, which contains 480 fuel channels and 6,240 bundles of uranium fuel. We're now looking down on the top of the reactor vault. The process of nuclear fission draws the heat from the fuel to boil ordinary water into steam. All that steam is transferred over to the turbine side of the station through large steam lines. So this is the turbine hall. It's almost four football fields long and 19 stories high. All four turbine generating units are located in this one giant area. You can see the color coding. Unit one is red. Unit two is yellow. Unit three is green. And unit four is purple. This color coding extends all the way through the systems for the unit and into the control room. Since all four generating units are identical, the color coding ensures correct unit and system identification. The turbine blades are shaped like a fan, where steam enters and turns the blades. In the center is a connecting shaft that rotates at 1,800 times a minute as the steam pushes the blades. 
At the very end is a relatively small piece of equipment, the actual generator where the electricity is made. From here, it's out to the grid and into homes and businesses. So finally, we come back to Unit Zero and the control room. Mission control for the whole station. Every important system in the plant is monitored and controlled from this room by highly trained and certified staff. Authorized nuclear operators go through an average of eight years of high-level training and testing to become fully certified by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. All Darlington staff are lifelong learners and spend up to 20% of their time in continual safety and job training. OPG nuclear generating stations use the defense in depth safety philosophy that sets the highest standards for plant design and operations. For critical components and systems, backup devices ensure redundancy at all times as well as fast acting shutdown systems. There is a secondary containment structure called the vacuum building. This 71 meter high, 24 story cylindrical concrete structure is connected to the reactor buildings by a pressure relief duct. Okay, that's about the Darlington. So numbers are quite different from Pickering to Darlington. As I said, it's uh, newer than the Pickering power, power plant, so it produces more electricity, and obviously it has more channels. Uh, the security um, building at the beginning of the video, uh, it was a very friendly environment up to 2001 where the 9-11 uh, attack happened in the U.S. and then brings up all this safety security uh, concerns. Before that, it's like people just walk in and out like any other regular uh, business place. Uh, moving on. I don't think this is uh, much important, but anyhow, as I said, the secondary side of the border, the secondary loop is about four megapascals. And the primary side is about 10 megapascals, and these are the pressures of the turbines. So <clears throat> this is the first C, actually, reactor control. Liquid zones are the uh, primary controls. Um, liquid zones um, are like comp compartments inside the reactor core, uh, which is filled with light water. So light water absorbs um, neutrons compared to higher number of neutrons compared to heavy water. Um, depending on the required reactor power change, if it requires to bring the reactor power down, uh, the first thing is <clears throat> first thing that the reactor regulating uh, system would do is to fill up these liquid zone components with. Um, compartments with uh, light water. So that light water will capture more neutrons and then um, reduce the number of neutrons available for the second generation of the second um, second generation of the chain reaction, um, bringing the reactor to subcritical. So the reactor power is going down. If it requires to raise the reactor power again, so our, our reactor regulatory system will ask to reduce the 
um, water inside the liquid zone compartments, reducing light water, meaning reduced number of neutrons captured. So available number of neutrons for the next generation fission reaction is higher than the before one. So the reactor is going super critical. Uh, during normal operation, it maintained to a certain level that the neutron numbers are balanced out, so reactor power will not change. Agesterods are usually outside of the reactor core. If it needs to bring the reactor power down at a higher rate, those adjuster rods can be driven into the reactor core. So adjuster rods are made out of boron. Uh, which is another good neutron absorber. So when the adjuster rods are driving into the reactor core, um, more and more neutrons get captured by adjusters. That's the second um, component used for the reactor power maneuvering. Primary liquid zone and the backup is adjusters. <coughs> and the control absorbers. Uh, doing pretty much the same thing and flux flattening. So shutdown system one um, is the um, uh, independent from all the above systems. So SDS are not for the reactor regulating, it's just for the shutdown. Uh, it's a safety feature. Um, and SDS two is liquid poison injection. So SDS one has shut off rods again made out of uh, boron uh, and drops into the reactor core without any driving in. So control absorbers can drive in at a different rate, uh, depending on the required uh, rate of power reduction. Uh, but um, shutdown rods are just uh, de-energized and drop into the reactor core by gravity. So it's vertically dropping into the reactor core. And the SDS2 is a liquid injection um, system, which is a horizontal system. So SDS 1 and 2 are completely independent uh, shutdown systems. They have the same capability to shut down the reactor within um, uh, two seconds, less than two seconds. There's so much independent. Two different design groups worked on these two systems. Not a single person worked on the both systems. And they're powered by two different um, System, uh, two different ways or source of power. SDS-1 is by gravity, SDS-2 is by uh, helium pressure driven system. And they use two different uh, technologies to capture the neutrons. Uh, SDS-1 use boron rods, SDS-2 use uh, gadolinium nitrate. So gadolinium has a higher um, neutron absorption cross-section as well. Uh, so they're completely independent and they're located in completely different locations in the reactor building, the containment building. So if one system is failed due to, let's say, some fire event happened and SDS-1 instrumentation uh, disturbs and SDS-1 is not available, but still SDS-2 can safely shut down the reactor because it's physically separate um, in the field. <laughs> Okay, this is another video. Ontario Power Generation owns and operates the Pickering and Darlington Nuclear Generating Stations. The two stations have a combined generating capacity of about 6,600 megawatts, which meets more than 30% of Ontario's electricity needs. The Pickering Nuclear Station is comprised of six operating can-do units that generate approximately 14% of Ontario's needs. Safety of the public and staff is OPG's top priority. Pickering Nuclear has been maintained and safely operated for more than 40 years. Our nuclear stations are designed with multiple safety systems and are staffed by station personnel who are well trained to ensure safe operation of the station. All can-do stations like Pickering Nuclear Generating Station have multiple diverse independent safety systems, backup electrical power, cooling water supplies, and other barriers for protecting the public in the extremely unlikely scenario of a major nuclear event. This video will illustrate the many barriers that are currently in place at the Pickering Station. 
and the enhancements that are being made to these barriers to further prevent an event similar to Fukushima from occurring at Pickering. The fundamental nuclear safety principles followed by all staff at OPG nuclear facilities are based on what is referred to as the three C's, control, cool, and contain. For all activities, priority is given to ensuring that at all times the reactor power is controlled, that the fuel is cooled, and that the radiation is contained. Supporting the three C's principle are five levels of defense which ensure that multiple independent and diverse barriers are maintained to protect the three C's at all times. The five levels of defense assure that the likelihood of accidents are minimized and that the resulting likelihood of a large radiological release is extremely small. Pickering's five levels of defenses are robust design and conservative operation, reliable process systems, multi-groups of engineered safety systems, flexible emergency mitigation equipment, comprehensive emergency preparedness plans. The following illustrates how control, cool, and contain function and the robustness of Pickering's design, which is the first level of defense. If an event occurs where it is required, reactor power is automatically reduced and the reactor is shut down. This is the first C, control. Although the reactor is shut down, the fuel in the reactor continues to generate a small amount of heat, so the fuel is continuously cooled. Like all other nuclear power plants, Pickering's normal process systems are capable of cooling the reactor. If normal cooling is interrupted, a unique and reliable design feature of all can-do stations called natural circulation will continue to cool the fuel. Natural circulation provides enough time for normal power to be restored or an alternative means of cooling to be established. Another important feature of the can-do design is the ability to cool the reactor using the very large inventory of water in the moderator tank. In the unlikely event that natural circulation fails, maintaining the moderator tank filled and continuously replenished with water will keep the reactor cool. Any steam that is created from fuel cooling that may be released to the reactor building is managed by air conditioning units. The ACUs cool and condense the steam and thereby reduces pressure within containment. The Pickering Vacuum Building, another important design feature for all multi-unit can-do stations, is also available to condense and contain any steam. The Pickering containment system minimizes radiological releases by virtue of its very large volume, thick concrete structure, and maintained at negative pressure by the vacuum building. To control containment pressure in the longer term, a filtered air discharge system comprised of high efficiency filters can be used for controlled filtered venting. To illustrate how the three C's are protected by the multiple levels of defense, Consider a station event where there is a total sustained loss of all off-site electrical power. The Pickering station has multiple diverse and independent sources of on-site electrical power that prevent the loss of off-site power from progressing to a total station blackout. If power from the electrical grid becomes unavailable, selected Pickering units will continue to power the reliable station process systems automatically. These systems are the second level of defense. Also available is the auxiliary power system that is comprised of two redundant jet engine power generators that can power the station process systems. With electrical loads being supplied by a Pickering unit or the auxiliary power system, Pickering's process systems will ensure that the three C's are maintained. This will safely end the event. Like all other can-do stations, Pickering has two groups of diverse engineered safety systems that can each protect the three C's independently. Pickering A units were originally designed with one group of engineered safety systems, which ensure that the reactor power is controlled, the fuel is cooled, and the radiation is contained. Since its initial operation, Pickering A has been modernized to have an equivalent second group, which are additional independent and diverse engineered safety systems to further protect the three Cs. These two groups of safety systems are the third level of defense. The primary group of safety systems are automatically powered by standby generators upon loss of the electrical grid. There are 12 standby generators at Pickering, of which only four are required to power the safety systems and assure that the three C's are maintained. An independent, diverse, and seismically qualified secondary group of safety systems are also available to protect the three C's. This secondary group of systems are powered by the emergency power generators and select standby generators. Successful operation of either group of the engineered safety systems will safely end the event and prevent a large radiological release. 
Although it is very unlikely, should the engineered safety systems fail to end the event, Pickering has in place severe accident management procedures and supporting flexible emergency mitigation equipment. This is the fourth level of defense that has been significantly enhanced following the lessons learned of the Fukushima event. The equipment consists of portable diesel-powered generators and pumps that allow the repowering of essential station systems and cooling water addition through permanently installed quick connections. With the successful protection of the three C's being achieved through emergency mitigation equipment, the event is safely ended and the large radiological releases are prevented. For a complete station blackout and a resulting large radiological release to occur, all the previous four levels of defense would have to fail. This is extremely unlikely. Although Pickering has an excellent safety record and the risk of a large radiological release is already extremely low, further safety enhancements are committed in the Periodic Safety Review Integrated Implementation Plan. The cooling capabilities of the third level of defense at Units 1 and 4 are being strengthened. A new plant modification is being made that will allow the use of existing diesel fire water pumps to provide additional backup cooling water. The diesel fire pumps would be unaffected by losses of both off-site and on-site electrical power. The above modifications further bolsters defense in depth and practically eliminates the likelihood of a severe accident progressing beyond the capabilities of the third level of defense. Pickering will also enhance the reliability of the EME function that supports controlled, filtered venting. When these modifications are factored into the probabilistic safety assessment, the calculated risk of Pickering will be comparable to the risk limits that have been established for a new plant. Although further safety enhancements are being made and the likelihood of a severe vent at Pickering has been practically eliminated, OPG and the province of Ontario have in place comprehensive emergency response plans that cater to a large-scale nuclear emergency. This is the fifth level of defense. As illustrated in the recent large-scale emergency exercise that was conducted at Pickering in 2017, emergency preparedness procedures are in place and incorporated into periodic drills and exercises for emergency response. The Pickering Nuclear Generating Station plays an important role in providing clean, low-cost power for the province of Ontario. With its robust design, multiple diverse redundant safety features, and safety-first operating philosophy, the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station will continue to operate safely through... So that's uh, summarize all the safety features that I talked, uh, talked to you guys earlier. So now um, we'll look into a contribution um, that we can make as chemical uh, engineering graduates. Um, So <clears throat> it's basically the day-to-day -day activities uh, that we're going to uh, deal with. Um, and I just um, bring up some things that we can help, um, like what you're going to study as a chemical engineer, process engineer, uh, that can uh, be applied in the, in, the, in the nuclear industry. So D2 upgrading <clears throat> is one, um, it's like more like a distillation process, but it's uh, quite um, uh, energy demanding distillation process. That's why D2 is very expensive and uh, we're really worried about losing D2 in the reactors and the vapor recovery of the dryers is coming to recover any D2 or loss to the uh, reactor containment as the vapor. So it, Basically, just two things. These dryers uh, dry out the uh, containment uh, inside the containment, and it absorbs a D2O, little D2O, and then uh, recondense it back to liquid stage. So that will one thing that will recover expensive D2O, and the second one is um, that will reduce the amount of D2O uptake uh, by the people working inside the containment. So D2O again is um, decay into H2O with uh, with time, but uh, any significant uptick of D2O could uh, cause uh, health concerns. Um, 
filtration and water treatment in this greenhouse is again um, where uh, basically uh, the main, um, I would say the main component of the station. If this greenhouse fell, there's no cooling water to the whole station and it's going to be multiple units shut down. So in Pickering a Station, one unit produce about $1 million per day. So six units, $6 million. But nobody really cares about this greenhouse. This is just a sad thing. Uh, it's again a place where we can uh, put our contribution to bring it, uh, maintain it uh, to the standards and uh, keep the stations running. Um, again, heat transfer, boilers, heat exchangers, uh, all the things that you learned in the, the during the program or the um, degree um, going to help uh, to understand the system for sure, plus troubleshooting and um, suggesting process improvements. They always open up for process improvements, even though it's very restricted process, but if you can, um, if you can justify doing certain things will add value to the process, uh, they always try to implement those. Um, it is uh, this opportunity to uh, introduce new things. So in the in the Pickering station, uh, after <clears throat> implementing the first stage, uh, some people came up with uh, the new idea of um, moisture separators and reheaters. Uh, which was not included in the primary design. So it's basically uh, extract steam from the high pressure turbine to reheat the low pressure turbine after the first low pressure turbine is reheats to um, reduce the moisture content of the steam going into the low pressure turbines, which eventually reduce the corrosion inside the turbine. So it's uh, clearly increase the lifetime of the turbines. It's adding a moisture separator, which is a centrifuge, and a uh, Murray heater, which is again the superheating um, heat exchanger. So it's basically a straight uh, process operation. Um, process operations. Uh, then the process control. If you ever learn about that. All the regulating systems use feedback loops and a lot of set points, controlling of the set points, boiler levels, pressures, heat transport pressure, and all the systems connected to the controls that can um, automatically feed uh, and bleed systems. Um, and uh, <clears throat> significant amount of IX columns to different systems. <laughs> Heat transport system has their own uh, ion exchange columns. Uh, light water side, uh, demon water system has their own uh, ion exchange columns. Entry cooling system has their own ion exchange columns. Like um, a lot of improvements, a lot of opportunities there. Um, so as routine operations, we do sample uh, heat transport water, moderator water, and um, light water side to maintain uh, required uh, pH levels, uh, for the maintain the required ion levels, to maintain required um, dissolved oxygen levels. Dissolved oxygen is pretty significant for the corrosion. So hydrocene is added to excavate the oxygen dissolved in the water. And uh, especially in the GSS, that means guaranteed shutdown stairs, when the unit is shut down, the pH maintenance in the moderator system is very crucial. Um, so to provide guaranteed shutdown, um, inject uh, gadolinium nitrate into the system. If pH drops, uh, sorry, if pH increased, uh, this gadolinium nitrate is going to convert into gadolinium hydroxide, which is a precipitate. So that will eventually reduce the effectiveness of gadolinium in the moderator system uh, to capture any neutrons and maintain the reactor guaranteed subcritical. Uh, it's, it is a big issue and it happens several times. Uh, one time it happened due to oil uh, added into the system uh, advertently and then uh, 
lot of effort had to put in to find out why it's precipitating. It's not the pH, it's just the oil uh, collaborating with that. Um, so certain chemical and process engineering inputs um, uh, exactly over there. And the uh, kinetics chemistry uh, involves the xenon transient, uh, which, which shows you why the reactor cannot be operated anywhere below 60% full power. <laughs> That's why we never use uh, nuclear reactors to match up with the uh, demand. They only provide in base loads. The reason is here. <clears throat> uh, once the reactor trip happened, that means the reactor is not producing any um, neutrons anymore. So xenon is a fission product. Plus it is a huge uh, neutron absorber. Um, so it start to build up xenon uh, load. So milk is a unit used um, to measure the amount of reactivity. So don't think too much about it, it's just a unit about the reactivity. So xenon is having a negative reactivity because it absorbs neutrons. If there's something you can do to increase the number of neutrons, that is a positive reactivity. So adjusters, <clears throat> usually inside the reactor core, which can withdraw. So adjusters are boron rods inside the reactor core, keep absorbing neutrons, but we can withdraw these adjusters out of the reactor core, uh, which will add positive reactivity. Uh, that's the worth of adjusters is about minus 28 to 50 mil K. So xenon is overriding that within like 40 minutes. That's the poison override time. If the reactor tripped, and within 40 minutes, if the reactor can get back to 60% full power or more, that reactor can sustain. If it takes more than 40 minutes, that beats this uh, worth of the adjuster rods. That's the only positive reactivity that we have in the reactor core with drawing the adjusters. If that beats after 40 minutes, then that we have to wait all the way up to this point to bring the reactor back in service. So that is about 40 hours. Um, that's why you don't like shutting down these reactors. They're not like shut down after five hours or six hours cool down. You can't just turn it on. It's just, we have to wait um, throughout this um, xenon transient. Uh, that's another video. I don't think uh, we have enough time for all those things. I will show you um, inside the reactor building and uh, <clears throat> uh, the daily activities that we are doing. I will talk about that at um, the same time. So if you have any um, any questions, I think it's the time um, to raise. Uh, um, this is just a refurbishment video. I will play it later on the session. But um, if you have any questions, like um, anything not relevant to relevant or irrelevant to the presentation or the things I talked about, uh, you're warmly welcome. Ask uh, any question, and um, we can go from there. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the valuable and insightful address uh, to our topic today, uh, nuclear power generation and possible contributions from chemical and process engineering. Uh, that was thoroughly enlightening and inspiring for all of us, and I'm pretty sure our audience learned a lot from you. Here's the time for another interesting segment, the Q&A session. Dear audience, we are ready to give you the opportunity to raise your questions. You can use either a raise hand option or the chat box to send your questions. I will narrate your questions to Mr. Udita Vijayaratna. I hope everything is clear and this opportunity is yours to get your doubts clarified and enrich your knowledge. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yeah. So are there any specific skills or knowledge the areas that uh, you should have when we are working in a nuclear power plant? Uh, in terms of knowledge, obviously you will get 
start out training <clears throat> before doing anything. So uh, it's only the background. So for these uh, employments, they're looking only for the high school, not even for the degree. But most of the people work in the power station. They have like, as you call it, power generators, some college program. But it's basically the science background for the um, advanced level in, in Sri Lanka. If you can prove that, that you have done science and have sound understanding on the science, that's all you need to start up. And as I said, 18 months training program it could go up to two years depending on the uh, content. Uh, build up all the required skills and knowledge uh, because those training is system specific. But if you go further up in the career ladder like authorized nuclear operator, it's going to be another five years, five to six years training program, which gives more um, in-depth knowledge and uh, how uh, you're going to react to a certain situation, how um, you're going to work under stress. It's like a lot of uh, other factors. Um, yeah, basically, um, you just need the basic science understanding to begin with. Thank you. And before the session starts, some students have sent some questions to us. Uh, one question is, what role do chemical and process engineers play in improving the process efficiency of nuclear power generation? Okay, so in terms of efficiency, um, one thing uh, they have done before is to introduce those um, uh, steam uh, reheaters and um, moisture separators. Uh, other than that, um, the efficiency wise, the only lagging thing is the uh, steam cycle efficiency. That's where the limiting factor is. Um, as chemical and process engineers can contribute uh, for the um, corrosion prevention side, like adding hydrazine, those all things are added up, <laughs> are added up as the reactors operation in commercial operation that's where the problems are identified and addressed as we go on the on the journey so um corrosion prevention degassing so this like something called deaerator it's a open uh, heat exchanger um produce um steam uh, with um, extracted stream it's flowing through the water uh, like um steam and water mixed in the deaerator and brings out all the dissolved and uh, suspended um, uh, gas particles or deaerate the liquid to maintain the chemistry. Um, that's kind of uh, improvements, like not, not in terms of energy wise, not the um, energy efficiency, but it's just more of like um, lifetime expansion things. Uh, one other thing, uh, process in engineering input um, was given to the gray locks. Gray lock um, is kind of, how can I explain that? It's like different bends that used in the um, primary heat transport system, which has pretty significant um, turbulent flow in that area, contribute to the wall thinning. And eventually identify the reason for the wall thinning is metal particles are withdrawn from one section and then deposit in, in the, inside the reactor core. So maintaining the chemistry and the flow conditions of, of the heat transport system eventually reduce that um, wall thinning rate significantly. It's up to like 10 to 18% reduction. Uh, which is again an input uh, from fluid dynamic side. Um, uh, what else I can think about? Uh, some sort of controlling inputs like 
uh, seconds, like backup systems that have um, control CVs and all the things. Sometimes they have uh, improvements with the uh, control logics um, that can give some input. Yeah, those are the areas. Moving on, there's another question. What are the potential career paths for chemical engineers interested in working in the nuclear power industry? Um, so, uh, it has like a lot of paths. So, first, if you're interested in chemistry side, uh, we always have chemtechs uh, who basically analyze all the samples, um, Give up, uh, give give up the results day to day, and then shut down status. So like routine sampling and um, maintain the chemical chemistry control because chemistry has significant input uh, in the power generation. And if if some system is running um, out of the specs of the chemistry specs, that can put the unit and shut down clock. Meaning if we fail to correct that um, um, chemistry issue within certain time, like 24 hours, 48 hours, 60 hours, the reactor needs to shut down. Uh, so Chemtech is one option. And the nuclear operator is another one. Um, I have to say nuclear operator is more of a field job that you're going to expose to radiation, ionizing radiation, high temperature environment. So yesterday the ambient temperature inside the station was 49 degrees Celsius. It's still June, not even mid of the summer. It can go up to 55 to 60 degrees sometimes. Uh, and the authorized nuclear operator is a control room uh, operator. <clears throat> so you need to have some sort of field experience to get into that position, but it's obviously a opportunity to get into that position. Um, the, at that point, um, most likely you're getting the certification from Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And um, as engineering roles, so those are the operating role, operation roles. So for the engineers, you have uh, design engineers, uh, maintenance engineers, control techs, and um, those roles, so design uh, engineers mainly involved with, um, we're not obviously doing much design works at this stage of the station, but it's like if some system needs some improvement and if someone suggests something that should go through the design engineers first, and they're gonna pull up all the flow sheets and design drawings and then try to understand what's suggested and what drawbacks in the systems that you can contribute uh, the suggestion and then um, do some uh, risk assessment to make sure that it will not affect any other subsystem or it will not affect uh, the safety of the people work in the station as well as the public. And uh, design engineers are also dealing with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for the license renewal. So they have to sign off the paperwork to ensure that these systems are reliable and can operate to a certain period of time in future without uh, risking anyone's safety. Um, and then the maintenance engineers are the busiest engineers in the station because imagine we use in 1960 to 70 technology in 2023. And um, things break down. And as I said, if the original component is not available to replace the main, most likely we're going to re, uh, repair the existing thing and then put it back to the service. Uh, if, if we really can repair it, then they had to ask design engineers approval to get a similar uh, device, even a single pump, simple thing as a pump. You can just, you can just compare the head pressure and flow rate and replace with a new pump. It's not allowed in this station. So the maintenance staff working on to repair the broken down device and then bring it back service. If it's not, then the design engineer had to involve and then uh, get approval from the design engineer. 
so that uh, a similar device or sim uh, same or similar component can replace. Um, so in terms of management roles, uh, they also open up. So uh, nuclear, if you start with a nuclear operator, then the nuclear operator can go into authorized nuclear operator, which is the control room operator, or he, he can go into supervising nuclear operator, which is the field operator, but it's more of like a supervising role. And then after that, supervising nuclear operator, the next level is field shift operating supervisor, FSOS. Um, and if you go to those authorized nuclear operator, on the other hand, can promote into control room shift supervisor. And then from there, you can go to uh, shift manager. Shift manager is responsible um, to dealing with the nuclear regulatory or the safety commission. And uh, his responsibility plays vital when the units are shut down, guaranteeing that the units are remaining shut down stairs and overall, if any emission happened to the environment or to the public, um, this ended up with the shift manager uh, being responsible for all the activities done by the people uh, below below him. So it's a critical role, but it's, it's um, quite interesting role. Yeah, so those are the um, carrier, carrier options. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Uh, sir, could you please discuss any current or upcoming research areas uh, where chemical engineers can uh, make significant contribu contributions to the field of nuclear power generation? Okay, so as I said, uh, those uh, corrosion problem is ongoing. Uh, that's why um, all major components most likely to get replaced after a certain number of years. Um, because as we look at uh, the reactor inlet side and the outlet side has two different temperatures, significantly different temperatures. And as a result of that, um, solubility factor for the ferrous or Fe2+, 3+, plus, plus, going to significantly change from inlet to outlet side. So um, that's an open uh, research area to come up with solutions to uh, reduce the rate of corrosion in the primary heat transport system. Uh, I know there's like a lot of research work going on, but it's like still they're not um, at the happy about the outcome. Uh, obviously there's improvement going on, but it's not, it's not significantly um, solve the issue, I would say, because all the units, almost all the units in Pickering had to shut down um, every like one to two years to replace the gray locks. So that's all the bends that are in the reactor phase that has weird fluid dynamics, turbulent flow, and the outlet, reactor outlet side always uh, face the erosion or losing the material and it's going to end up in depositing in the reactor core. So that creates two problems. One is uh, losing material in the uh, outlet side next to the wall, pipe wall thin. So it could end up with a pressure boundary failure. And the other side is um, those metal particles going into the reactor core uh, makes those metal particles radioactive. And then they can travel all over the circuit causing a hotspot. Hotspots are like any source that can emit more than 200 milligrams of gamma radiation. So those hotspots can go anywhere in the circuit. So that's why they're worried about that. That's that's the primary uh, research option. So study about the wall thinning and then uh, come up with any chemical addition or any uh, softening to the water circuit. But again, the implementation stage is not quite easy as in the other industries, obviously, because we need the approval from the design engineers and then go to the uh, regulator and then get their approval. 
and then uh, back to the implementation. That's one thing. And the other research area is the dryers. <coughs> As of now, we're using a bed dryers. Um, it has like a synthetic uh, beads that can uh, absorb moisture in, into the surface. And then um, during the regeneration cycle, that liquid uh, release back uh, in the vapor state and then condense and then recover. So those dryers are not up to the technology yet. So that's another area we can um, uh, study about the dryer materials and then um, introduce something new that can um, absorb D2O and then um, probably have a less impact from the oil vapor. Because one significant issue with the dryers is when the systems are running at high temperature, oil evaporates, and this oil mixed up with moisture and then absorbs, adsorbs to the dryers. And in the regeneration, the oil is not released from the beads. So drying beads are covered with oil with time, and that reduces the ability of the dryer to function and absorb more water. Uh, so we had to replace dry beads time to time and um, the dryers are not really effective. So drying is another research area available. Um, uh, one more thing is the uh, end shield cooling system. It has like uh, softeners going into the system. Uh, time to time, because you use ion exchange columns everywhere in the station, and those uh, strainers are uh, going to fail with time, and then softening beads go into the systems, and those beads get radioactive and become hot spots. So if you can come up with a new research idea to do the water softening um without involving the ion exchange columns, if there's another approach for that, um, that will be uh, definitely a good um, research area because these ion exchange resins eventually um, get radioactive and then um, changing those resins is a very, um, it's a job that involves a high dose of radioactivity. So again, if someone is interested in joining the industry, uh, we use radio uh, radioactivity exposure permit, which is called a REP. So REP is kind of a document that gives you the permission to exposure to certain amount of gamma, certain amount of tritium, and certain amount of uh, alpha radiation. Uh, different jobs has different uh, thresholds. So as I said, ion exchange resin uh, replacement is a high risk job which involves significant gamma radiation. Um, again, if um, someone has to do that job, it's like he's picking up a lot of uh, radioactivity. Those. Um, as long as you're with, uh, staying within the rep limits, it's fine. Any exposure that is pre-documented and ex uh, expected to get that radiation dose is it's acceptable in the industry, but if you're only expected to get, say, two millirems, that's what we're expecting during normal reactor rounds per day, sorry, per shift. If you're expecting only two millirems and if you're getting like 20 millirems, then definitely there are going to be questions and there are going to be investigation what's going on. So, yeah, those three options are always available for the research um, and contribution from uh, process and chemical process knowledge. Thank you, sir. Dear audience, are there any questions? I think the questions are over. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your invaluable experience gathered in your exemplary journey so far. Your explanations for our questions were easily understandable and valuable for everyone. We are now certain that our students are aware of another engaging part they can undertake as chemical and process engineers. 
And now I would like to invite Ms. Kavindya Valgampaya, event chair of this ISOTOP, Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students, to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Sasini. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we experience the second episode of Isotalks, Season 2, 12th Isotalks organized by the Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students, University of Peradeni. On behalf of SCAPES, I would like to extend my heartfelt vote of thanks to all those who have contributed to the success of this event. First, I would like to mention our guest speaker, Engineer Udita Vijayaratna, for not only taking the time out of his busy schedule to be with us on this occasion, but also for educating us with his excellent talk on the subject. Your dedication and commitment to sharing knowledge are truly admirable. Next, I would like to express my gratitude to our beloved academic staff of Department of Chemical and Process Engineering for their valuable support and encouragement in all our efforts. I would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to the senior treasurer of SCAPES, Dr. Nadish Adasurya, for the support and guidance you gave us as always. Furthermore, I thank all the committee members of the SCAPES and the students of the Department of Chemical and Process Engineering as well for dedicating their time and efforts to ensure the, this may event a success. Finally, I thank all the participants because without your presence, this event would not have been a possibility. Once again, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Kavindya. And thus, we have come to the end of this amazing session. Hope you all had a wonderful time with us. Thank you everyone for joining us today amidst your busy schedules. So with the hope of meeting you again on another memorable day with an inspiring topic, it's time for us to wind up today's session. Good night, everyone. Stay safe.